Harold Pfeiffer and uh, Professor Kippergaard. Uh, the first uh, talk is uh, by Harold Pfeiffer from uh, PICA on uh, current research in emergency. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so far, this, the summer school, I, I gather, has been rather well organized and contained, that you learned about a few topics in, in, in detail. This talk is quite different in that I'm trying to cover, give you a sense of the, the breadth of numerical relativity research that's currently ongoing. And so I will touch on many different things, uh, most of them in, in a very brief amount of time. OK. Um, let me first turn on this one here. As for the outline of, of the next one and a half hours, I would like to start with the motivation, uh, then spend quite some time talking about binary black holes, the history, recent technical improvements, um, about our own spectral code, about precession, and a little bit about the big picture. Then beyond vacuum general relativity, um, mixed binaries, binary neutron stars, a little bit about co-collapse supernovae, but nothing too deep. And then I'll try to offer a little bit of thoughts about where the future might lead us in the next five or 10 years, the time scale you guys are interested in in, to, in terms of, of getting going with your own research. Okay, motivations for numerical simulations are quite varied. Um, we would like to know how general relativity behaves in various situations that are not accessible any other way in a dynamic strong field regime. For instance, when two compact objects collide, uh, when doing critical collapse, or when, when looking at higher dimensional gravity. The focus of the summer school is um, gravitational wave astrophysics, so the compact object mergers will be the most important one in this category. Another reason is to do astrophysics simply to know, to figure out what happens in the universe in certain processes, when stars collapse, when compact objects collide. And the most pressing motivation right now is to aid gravitational wave detectors. So Sathya, who is not yet here, will talk about this in the second lecture, so I have only a single slide here. Um, gravitational wave detectors use numerical relativity information in a wide variety of ways. There are three different ways where the waveforms are important. Um, when you're looking for signals to begin with, and when you're trying to figure out what you have seen for parameter estimation, but also when you're not seeing signals, for instance, there are proposals that eccentric binary black holes exist. And let's see, say LIGO doesn't find eccentric binary black holes. Then the two things could happen. A, they don't exist, or B, eccentric binary black holes exist, but LIGO search techniques are not sensitive to them. And the only way to find out is to actually simulate how the waveforms from eccentric binary black holes look like. Um, beyond the gravitational waves, there's the vast open area of uh, so-called electromagnetic counterparts. Um, objects and sources that are not only visible in gravitational waves, but also with uh, radio, uh, radio X-ray gamma rays or neutrinos. And there again, it's quite important to figure out and know what type of electromagnetic counterparts to expect, what frequency range, which duration, uh, and so forth, what spectrum, in, so that to guide telescopes to look for these electromagnetic counterparts. And again, once they have seen them, to be able to extract as much information from the source as possible. OK, to compute waveforms, um, the early in spiral can be done analytically with post-Newtonian theory. The late in spiral merger can only be done with numerical relativity. And in between is this gray area where we don't really trust post-Newtonian quite, quite enough because we are too close to merger and which is also quite hard to reach into from the microrelativity side because really long simulations are very, very difficult. Um, that's the standard picture for a waveform you will be seeing quite a bit. Uh, it's the usual chirp, increasing frequency and increasing amplitude until the merger and then a, a exponential decay. More realistic waveforms look like this. 
Um, this is a, a spinning processing non-equal mass binary. And so you have a, a lot of new features here. First of all, you still kind of have the chirp that you had beforehand. You start at low frequencies, you go to higher frequencies, and you end at really high frequencies in the merger ring down. Um, the amplitude also goes up generally from small to large. But the amplitude is now modulated because the orbital plane precesses due to the spins. And depending how the orbital plane is oriented relative to, to the Earth, you might get more stronger or weaker gravitational wave emissions. Higher order temporal harmonics are important. If you look closely, you see that every second peak is higher than every other one. And that depends on whether the smaller black hole comes toward you or moves away from you. Um, there's a strong dependence on inclination of the source. I'll show examples later on. And not apparent here, but, but perhaps the most important effect, the spins also impact the phasing of the waveform. It looks like a sine wave. This one looks like a sine wave. But a lot of information is hidden in the precise phasing, whether you have 27 or 27.5 cycles in a certain frequency regime. And this is different between these two cases. OK, I was choking yes yesterday that I actually might be wanting to give this talk with just a single slide. When I made this, uh, added to this slide showing the history of numerical relativity, and I found more and more things to put on it, it became quite crowded. So I'm, I'm talking about the history now just to give you some context that this is not a young field, that work has been going on for, a, for quite a long time. And the work in numerical relativity basically falls into three categories. Um, there has been very early work highlighted here, going back to um, the ADM formulation 3 plus 1 uh, arose in 62. The first numerical simulation was actually done in 1964, believe it or not. Then, um, 10 year hiatus in 75, 77, the same two black hole head-on simulation was attempted again. More progress, but still nothing to to be too proud of. In 84, Bill Unruh proposed the idea of black hole excision. Because if you go inside, light co inside black holes, the light cones tip completely over. So all information propagation is into the interior of the black hole. So Bill Unruh suggested you can actually get away without simulating the interior of the black holes. If you're only interested in the outside world, put your boundary inside the event horizons and take advantage of the uh, shape of the light cone, the orientation of the light cone, and simply cease to worry about what happens in the interior of the black holes at the singularities. Avoid all the singularity problems. What else do we have here? Um, in 92, 93, Matt Shoptwick and then Abrams and Evans looked for the, looked discovered what's called by now critical phenomena in general relativity. So what they did is they started out with a bunch of matter that is collapsing. Choptwick used matter. Abrams and Evans used gravitational waves. So the, the matter is collapsing towards the origin. And if you have only a little bit of matter, the matter uh, collects at the origin and then disperses again. And what's left is outgoing matter, say scalar waves, plus flat space. However, if you have a lot of matter, as it collapses onto the origin, it actually collapses and forms a black hole. So what you have is low amplitudes, dispersal, flat space, <coughs> high amplitudes, collapse to a black hole. So far, so good. And now what Matt did is he actually asked the interesting question, this is a one parameter continuous family of solutions. I can change my amplitude smoothly from low to high. Here one thing happens, here the other thing happens. So what's going on in the middle? And it turned out there's a lot of interesting phenomenology going on. You can make analogies to, to um, phase transitions in, in uh, condensed matter systems. You find self-similarity that you have an echoing solution that looks like it did 
an instance before on a smaller scale, and a lot of more interesting things. Um, we had the first attempts to construct binary black hole initial data. We had, yet again, revisiting the head-on collision of two black holes in axis symmetry. This time around, it actually succeeded, and we got the full merge and, and ring down out of this. And there were more attempts of evolving black holes and merging black holes and trying to extract information from the merging black holes all the while, while the simulations kept on crashing and blowing up. So the task back then was, how can we actually get something out of these funny crashing simulations? Um, then, around 1990 or 90, in the late 90s, somehow the character of the field changed. People went back to the basics and put in a lot of extra work improving various pieces that are necessary for black hole simulations. Um, we got the still widely used puncture data in 97. Uh, mesh refinement was uh, developed by several different groups. Um, the BSSN evolution system uh, came up in 1999. The B here is Thomas Baumgarde, who talked to you last week. Um, a lot of work went into understanding the properties of the evolution equations, hyperbolicity and so forth. A new way of constructing initial data, the gauge conditions that Mark Hennem talked about yesterday and two days ago that are also important to make the BSSN evolutions work. All these pieces came together. Um, also, at the, towards the end of this period, Prickman et al. actually managed to simulate one orbit of a binary black hole close to merger before their simulation crashing. And so this was a big advance, advance, advance back then. So a, a lot of pieces fell into place in these years. And then, of course, uh, starting in 2000 things, 2005, simulations begin to work. First, Pretorius showed how to do this with the first complete in-spiral merger ringdown waveform using a so-called generalized harmonic formulation. Did somebody talk to you about generalized harmonic? OK, good. And then briefly thereafter, um, two groups independently, one at Texas Brownsville, one at, at the NASA in, in, in Maryland, discovered how to get uh, in-spiral merger ringdown simulations with BSSN evolution systems and this moving puncture approach. Around the same time, my collaboration uh, um, got successful, or actually about a half a year or a year later after Pretorius, because we were duplicating some of his techniques, got successful with uh, doing spectral evolution of the in-spiral phase. Doing mergers turned out to be quite hard, so that was possible. That took another two or three years or so. So starting there, we could actually begin to simulate black holes and, and do interesting things with it. And so the, here's what's happening afterwards. The pink stuff here is what I consider interesting things in the sense that it's, it's actually caught the attention of people outside the strict numerical relativity fields. Um, the blue stuff is more like technical improvements, which are important within the field, but which the outside world doesn't really care much about. And the gray stuff is uh, analytical work that is important to support the numerical work. So what happened after these breakthroughs? Um, the first obvious goal were to compute kicks when binary black holes merge. If you have unequal mass black holes or unequal spin black holes, whenever you have an asymmetry in the system, you will get asymmetric gravitational wave emission, which carries off more linear momentum into one uh, sky direction than the other sky directions. And therefore, the remnant black hole will have a kick in the opposite way. This was first explored with non-spinning black holes, where you change the mass ratio around. And kicks were found first by Baker et al. and then by Gonzalez uh, et al., including Mark Hannem and Sasha Husser, uh, finding black hole kicks up to 130 kilometers per second. Very briefly thereafter, people began looking at spinning black holes and discovered quite rapidly that if you have spins and you have the spins pointing the right way, 
you can get way larger black hole spins, uh, black hole kicks. So these binary black hole super kicks were discovered with kick velocities up to something like 4,000 kilometers per second. That really caught the attention of astrophysics because if you have, if you look at cosmology as galaxies form and collide with each other during the lifetime of the universe, um, each galaxy is thought to have a supermassive black hole at its center. And as the galaxies merge, the supermassive black holes merge. But if you can now get kicks of something like 4,000 kilometers per second for the merged remnant black hole, this velocity is much larger than the typical um, potential energies within a galaxy. So if, if this were actually true and, and these supermassive uh, black holes would get kicks of several thousand kilometers per second, they would leave the galaxies. And so we would have this, this population of rogue supermassive black holes going through intergalactic space. And we wouldn't know, we wouldn't need to come up with a new explanation why every galaxy seems to have a black hole because they might, have le they might leave. What else do we have? Okay, so black hole kicks. Another important work that would start it very quickly is to construct waveform models <coughs> based on numerical simulations for use by the gravitational wave uh, detectors. Um, this got started first by uh, a chief back then at AEI with other folks at AEI and Jena with the phenomenological gravitational wave models, first for non-spinning ones, then for aligned spin ones. And somewhat later, University of Maryland and my collaboration picked up and developed a sequence of more and more comprehensive um, waveform models based on the so-called effective one body formalism. Also, all of numerical relativity came together in 2008 for the first time to work on the so-called NINJA projects. NINJA is a perfect example that whenever you have do something, you need to have a good acronym so people actually remember what you do. It stands for numerical injection analysis. The idea is to collect numerical waveforms, embed them in, uh, as in, in, in gravitational wave detector noise, and then run the LIGO search pipelines to see whether those signals would have been found by LIGO. We started this in 2008, and we right now, we then went on to do a second iteration of this with the second iteration wrapping up later this year. Um, despite all these progresses, or, or even so, there's still a lot of technical progress also being made. Um, better ways of extracting the gravitational waveforms are continuously being developed. Better ways of describing waveforms from processing systems are developed. I'll talk about both of them later on. And also, we are, we are making technical progress in terms of pushing mesh ratio, pushing spins. And quite recently, um, we're actually getting underway the field to doing large-scale parameter studies of, eccentric, uh, of processing binary black holes. So a lot has been going on over the years. And perhaps, not that, perhaps it's, it's not a coincidence that a lot of that, that activity pretty much started when LIGO became, began become reality because a lot of work is, is driven and motivated by LIGO and LIGO's needs. I should say, please ask questions whenever there seems to be something unclear. After I made my nice fa fancy slide here, I realized there's actually more things that should have gotten on there. For instance, uh, technical things like constraint damping and, and boundary conditions for the evolutions, or higher dimensional gravity, alternative theories of gravity, like for instance the unstable black hole strings that Louis Lena and Franz Pretorius were looking at. And I'm sure the audience here will have more uh, thoughts of what should have been included in, on, in this timeline. Okay, um, a few highlights of what I've just glossed over. Here's the abstract of this paper from 1964. Um, numerical calculations were carried out on an IBM 7090 electronic computer, yielding a mesh size of 51 times 151 grid points. Um, the calculations of all unknown functions, including a great number of input-output, 
which presumably was to, to paper back then or, or punch cards. And some built-in checking procedures took approximately four minutes per time steps. We ran for 50 time steps, a total time of 1.8 before the evolution crashed. So to put this 1.8 into context, Mark was yesterday talking about if you evolve with um, constant lapse and shift, a single black hole will crash at time pi. So they made it approximately halfway to pi back then. Fast forward um, to 2005, so here were the, the important papers by Franz Pretorius and, and the, Rochester, the, the now Rochester group and the, the NASA group, who also, who now managed to actually do black hole evolutions in earnest. But just to remind you how these, these first evolutions looked like, here are two images from, from Franz Pretorius' first paper. He did about half in orbit and merge and, and ring down and merge and ring down. And the waveforms had essentially some noise early on, then the, the merge and ring down signal, and that's it. There was essentially no in spiral at all, and wave extraction at radius 25, which we now know is, is utterly uh, insufficient. But still, this was the very first simulation that actually put all the pieces together and got binary black holes working. A few more examples of what has been done in, in these early years. I already mentioned the black hole kicks. Um, here's a figure from uh, the Gonzalez et al. paper. On the x-axis is the mass ratio, symmetric mass ratio. So 0.25 is equal mass. Here on the y-axis is the kick velocity. At equal mass, everything is symmetric at zero. Then it goes up, you reach a maximum, and if you were to go to infinite mass ratio, again the kick velocity would be zero because the small black hole is just too small to have any impact. And there's a maximum somewhere here with 170 or so, 150 or so kilometers per second. Um, here's the first simulation, or one of the first simulations exploring towards black hole superkicks. And so the, the setup there is you have the two black holes orbiting about each other. And you have the black hole spins in the orbital plane with spin directions opposite to each other. And depending what the precise spin orientation at merger is, um, so depending on the angle, you might get a kick upward or a kick downward or no kick at all. So what these set of simulations show it's different angles of the black hole spin in the orbital plane relative to the initial line connecting the two black holes. And sometimes the kick velocity is small, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. And then you, you use these types of data and, and make fits to find what the biggest uh, kick velocity would be. What is the difference of this spin configuration between this uh, RIT group and the NF group? This two spin configuration? Oh! Can we discuss this later with, with Sasha and Mark? I, I, I'm just worried that this might lead to a long, long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a plot I'll, I'll come to back later. Okay. Um, short recap of how binary black hole simulations work and the two different ways of running them. There's basically two different approaches to run binary black holes. Um, one of them on the left hand side uses puncture initial data, uh, BSSN with moving punctures, and also tends to use finite differences. The one on the right hand side uses different initial data, uses general harmonic and our, our spectral code. So let's start and go through piece by piece. Initial data Mark talked about, the puncture initial data basically gives you black holes represented on this um, red slice through the Penrose diagram, going from our asymptotically infinite, asymptotically flat end through the wormhole to some other asymptotically flat end on the other side of the black hole. Um, with this excision data, we take UNRU seriously and don't care about the interior of the black hole. So we construct initial data on an initial slice that extends from out at, at uh, infinity 
through the black hole horizon and stops somewhere inside the black hole horizon. You've heard about uh, BSSN with moving punctures, so I don't need to explain this again. Uh, Archive tells me you also heard about generalized harmonic, where you basically evolve the space-time metric and rewrite Einstein's equations such that um, you have wave equations acting on each component of the space-time metric. And those 10 different wave equations are then coupled by lower order terms. Plus there's this truly important term that Gundlach and Pretorius put in that causes the constraints to remain satisfied. And that was one of the key ingredients that Pretorius put in in 2005 to get his simulations going. Except for Pretorius, um, everybody on the left hand side uses finite differences with mesh refinement or adaptive mesh refinement. And there's quite a few groups around. And the right hand side is uh, split between uh, some work by Pretorius using finite differences and a somewhat larger collaboration uh, using this, the spectral code I'll, I'll talk about somewhat later. And our SXX collaboration by now has, has increased. It started at Cornell, expanded to Caltech, then I got hired at CETA, then two other members of us got hired at Washington State University and Cal State Fullerton, so it, it keeps on growing. Um, continuing, pieces and evolutions are generally done with finite differences, multi-domain spectral methods as a spec. And certainly up to about two years ago or three years ago, the conventional wisdom was that the finite difference simulations were robust and easy, could do many short simulations, but they have difficulty doing long simulations and accurate simulations. Whereas this in spec, um, spec code was deemed less robust and, and, and more difficult. Um, we could do a few truly outstanding long simulations in terms of accuracy and, and length, but we had quite problems doing the mergers. However, more recent, uh, all of this conventional wisdom is, is uh, weakening in that the finite difference codes become longer and more accurate. And uh, spec by now can do mergers quite routinely as well. Okay, I've tried to cook up a list of everybody I could remember who does numerical relativity. And again, there's probably names missing, so I, I ask the, the audience to supply more names. Going through this um, alphabetically, there's a moderate size complement in Canada, myself <coughs> at CETA, Louis Lehnert Perimeter, and Matt Schoptwick in Vancouver. In France, I'm aware of two groups, Enrico Brause at Paris and uh, Eric Gurgelio at, at Meudon. Germany, approximately four, the Albert Einstein Institute, Garching uh, focusing on, on supernovas, Jena focusing on black holes and neutron stars, Tübingen focusing on, on single neutron stars. Italy, I only know about Bruno Giacomazzo moving there in, in October this year. Uh, in Japan, there is Masaru Shibata's group, who's doing a lot of tremendously good work on, on neutron stars. New Zealand is involved in more mathematical aspects of, of numerical relativity. Sasha Husa is in Spain. Valencia. Valencia. Valencia is doing a lot of hydro stuff, exactly. Okay, I will update the slides afterwards <laughs> because this is getting too much and I will mistype names. <laughs> in, in England, there's Uli Spierhag at Cambridge and uh, in Wales, we have Mark Hannam. And Southampton. And a long li Sorry? Good point. And in the United States, there's a very, very long list of places. Brigham Young University, uh, David, Cal State Fullerton, Caltech, Cornell, Florida Atlantic, Georgia Tech, Long Island, NASA, Goddard, Princeton, Rochester Institute of Technology, Urbana, Champaign, Washington State, and again, probably quite a few more I've, I forgot. Okay, um, let me talk next about a few of the technical 
advances I've already highlighted earlier and a few that didn't fit on the slides earlier, just to give you some sense of how all these simple tools need to be combined together to actually get more relevant astrophysics output. Um, one thing that was dear to my heart for quite a few years was uh, to get rid of, of or to control the eccentricity of a binary black hole. So what comes out of the initial data formalism or what goes into the initial data formalisms are essentially parameters that choose the masses of the black holes and their spins and then three numbers that determine the orbit, the separation, and you can view, you can view the other two as either the, the linear momenta of the black holes or the orbital frequency and some radial velocity. And the tricky business is now, the separation is easy. You choose the separation based on how long a simulation you want to have. The larger you choose the separation, the more your orbits you expect to merge. But now the, the tricky part is um, how to choose the other two numbers, the momenta or orbital frequency and radial velocity, such that you get a certain eccentricity that you're interested in. Most importantly, zero eccentricity, because we believe that compact object binaries, gravitational wave emission, reduces eccentricity of the binary quite rapidly. So the task is, to find that unique choice of, of omega and, and radial velocity that gets you to the zero eccentricity in spiral. And what emerged over the years as the best way of doing this is some, as an iterative procedure. You start with as good initial guesses as you can, you evolve, and you find something like the black curve here, which shows the radial velocity as a function of time. So the radial velocity goes up and down down and up and down and up. A clear sign of an eccentric orbit. Uh, you can now analyze this, this motion and adjust the initial data parameters to reduce the eccentricity. And doing it once, you get the, the red curve. Doing it the second time, you get the blue curve. And so all look perfectly fine. This was the easy case for um, non-processing systems. And then it turned out playing the same game for processing systems um, was harder. And it's basically dealt with in, in a paper of myself with collaborators in 2010 and a paper of, of Sasha and, and Mark and, and, and Mike Burra in 2012. With enough care, you can still get, play the same game, but you need to be more careful what quantities you're analyzing and what conclusions to draw from them. For instance, it turns out um, the change in proper separation between the two black holes is a rather uh, unfortunate quantity to use. This wouldn't work. And the best one we know about is the time derivative of the orbital frequency. For some reason, there seems to be less gauge dependence than, than a, a measure of separation. Um, pushing uh, mass ratios has, has been pioneered or, or perfected by Uli Speerhacke and the RIT group, Carlos Lustro and, and Josef Zlochova, who both made it up to mass ratio of 1 to 100. Uli did head-on simulations. Here's the, a, a plot from his paper showing the emitted rate, uh, energy in, in gravitational waves. And for Carlos's talk uh, simulation, the best thing to do is to just show the movie. And what I find really pathetic here is that you need to zoom into the small black hole in order to see it at all. Otherwise, the small black hole is an, an almost tiny speck just going around the big black hole. They look so unequal in size because black hole radii are proportional to the mass. So quite different from any, any usual matter you might be aware of, where the radii go, radius goes like the cube root of the mass. And so zooming in just before merger, and now the little black hole, again, back in its original size, is being eaten by the big black hole. Yeah, I, I should have pointed out that, that here in the movie, the size of the little, little black hole is actually exaggerated by something like a factor of 10 or so. Um, Another important, relatively recent advance is to 
deal with black holes that have spins bigger than the so-called bone York limit. Um, simplest way of constructing initial data, puncture data, turns out to give you a limit on the black hole spin you cannot exceed of approximately 0.93. So if you want to simulate black holes with spins between 0.93 and 1, you need to come up with different ideas. Initial data turned out to be fairly straightforward. Um, Geoffrey Loveless did this in collaboration with myself and a few others in 2008. But it turned out that evolving these highly spinning black holes in itself posed quite a significant challenge. We are doing this with our excision code, and it turns out um, curved black holes have two horizons, an outer horizon R plus and an inner horizon R minus. And if you remember your analytical GR, only between the two horizons are your light cones completely ingoing. And, and the other piece you should remember from the curve solution, as the spin goes to one, the two horizons approach each other. <coughs> so we need to put the excision boundary between R plus and R minus, and there's increasingly little space between the two, so we need to control increasingly uh, uh, increasingly accurately where, what the excision boundary does. Took a few years, but eventually Geoffrey Loveless, with a lot of help by Mark Shade and Bela Silagi, uh, managed to do this, and here's a, the waveform and the orbital trajectory tracks of, I think this is the simulation with spins anti-aligned in 0.95, but there's another simulation with spins of 0.97. You might ask, why care? 0.93 sounds like a big number relative to 1. So why aren't we just done? The problem is that 0.93 is not a large number. Again, going back to Kerr, um, if you look at the Kerr solution, you will find that the square root of 1 minus spin squared comes up all over the place. So if you talk about nearly extremal black holes, this is the, the expansion parameter around extremality not just one minus spin. And because of the square root here, um, this function behaves very non-linearly. And it turns out at 0.97, epsilon spin is still only 0.37. So you're only in some sense two thirds there to extremality and you have one third to go. The spin 97 simulation of Joffrey is quite a bit better. It gets you from two thirds to three quarters but still, there's quite a lot of extra work that needs to be done to get even remotely close to, to small values of this epsilon spin. For instance, to push it down to 5%, you would need black hole spins of 0.999. Coincidentally, black hole spins of, of 0.998 or thereabouts have been suggested from, uh, by observational evidence based on X-ray binaries. Unfortunately, those electromagnetic observations are fairly hard to interpret, and so different groups arrive usually at different answers. But still, um, we have evidence that high spin black holes exist, and we know that 0.93 is not very extremal, so we need to go beyond and actually explore the 0.99 and, and beyond regime. Another neat study is the question whether a merged black hole actually settles down to Kerr or not. We all believe it does uh, because of black hole uniqueness, but it is nice to actually see it in practice. So Robert Owen did a study um, analyzing the horizon of the merged black hole in a gauge invariant way and compute, defining and computing various moments of the horizon. This one here is, is the, are the quadrupole moments. And for Kerr, you should find that one of them is non-zero at this value, and all the other ones should be identically to zero. And this here actually shows the numerical data with one mode in the numerical data um, asymptoting to the correct value, and everything else going down to 10 to the minus 8 or thereabouts. So quadrupole moment look OK. Uh, Rob pushed it further, looked at the octoboles, the same story, one non-zero mode and a bunch of zeros. Um, hexa 
decupole, same story again. The non-zero modes are where they're supposed to be. The zero modes are down. Now we're 10 to the minus 6 because those are harder to resolve. And he also did the 32 pole, which I can't pronounce in, in, in Greek. Sorry, how do I interpret this plot? Sorry? How do I interpret this plot? What is the so what's, what's going on here is the, this is an expansion of the horizon structure in spherical harmonics in a certain gauge invariant way. And if you play this game for Kura, it has a certain horizon structure because it's, it is axisymmetric, but it has some theta dependence. And so these plots compare the, the theta dependence of, of the exact curse, analytic curve solution to what we get out of a numerical simulation late in the run. What kind of horizon is it? Sorry? What horizon is it? Is it apparent horizon? This is the apparent horizon, yes. And where are the analytical calculations? The analytical calculations here are only indicated up on this plot, on, on this, where is it? On, on the first slide here. This, would, this gray line here is the analytic expectation from Kura. And all the other lines are from the numerical simulation. So initially you have a perturbed black hole, so all the modes are excited. And all the modes you don't want actually exponentially decay to zero as the black hole rings down. And the one mode you expect to have asymptotes to the, to the correct value. And this is true for the, the quadrupole, L equals two, but also L equals three, four, and five. Something else I believe is, is very worthwhile watching goes under the name of Cauchy characteristic matching. Here I, I guess I need to put some explanation of, of what's actually going on here. Again, we're starting out with this type of conformal diagram. And numerical simulations tend to have some finite outer boundary. We can't evolve all the way to infinity. So numerical simulations typically cover something like this green area here. We do some time stepping and slice out hypersurfaces in a finite region that does not extend all the way out to square plus. Because we're not at square plus, we can't extract the waveforms at square plus where they're actually well defined. We have to extract them at some finite radius and hope the waveforms are reasonably close to the ones at infinity, hope that coordinate effects don't mess us, mess, up, mess us up, and hope that we can somehow extrapolate away finite radius extraction effects. What now Cauchy characteristic extraction does is it runs the problem in two steps. You first run the usual three plus one evolution as we always do, and then you take data from the three plus one evolution and run a separate evolution system that propagates these data you have extracted here and propagates them out to future null infinity. And so what comes out of Cauchy characteristic evolution is now the waveform at square plus where it should, have, should be devoid of many of the coordinate effects and gauge effects that we have to deal with at finite radius. So this group of people, Christian Reiswick, um, Nigel Bishop, Maria Babiuk, uh, Bela Silagi, Dennis Polny, have worked over quite a few years and quite a few papers of improving and perfecting Cauchy characteristic uh, extraction. And it seems to getting close to actually being used essentially as a post-processing tool in, in most of all black hole evolutions. Something else one has to deal with once one has processing binaries is that the decomposition of the gravitational waves look way more complicated. Look first at the right image here and pretend you haven't read that this is about processing binaries. So pretending you haven't read anything else, I shall tell you this is how the waveform decomposition looks like for a non-processing one, say a non-spinning binary black hole. What is plotted here is the 2-2 two -two mode, the 3-3 three -three mode, the 4-4 four -four mode of a spherical harmonic decomposition of the waveforms. 
And the point to take away is, while there's quite a lot of different YLM co uh, coefficients, only very few of them are actually large for a non-processing binary. Because the orbital plane is fixed, we know what best set axis to use for the YLM coefficients, orthogonal to the orbital plane, and that turns out to simplify the gravitational radiation tremendously. Especially if you know that you only have one, two, three, or four or so important circular harmonic modes to deal with, if you now want to model the output of numerical simulations, it's enough to look at these four modes. Okay, so this is the slide that didn't include. And now look at the, at the left figure here. This is how this looks like for a processing binary. We start out with the orbital plane in the XY plane, and we do circular harmonic extraction uh, with the appropriate axis. So time equals zero at, at early on in the first few hundred M, the spherical harmonic axis is still well aligned with the orbital plane, and you get the separation of scales, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. But now as the orbit processes, um, the, the axis of emission of the gravitational waves no longer is well aligned with the spherical harmonics, and you get non-zero contributions in all the different M components as well. So what, what used to be very nicely split now looks like an utter mess. And so the reason I bring this up is not to show you that there's a mess, but that also as, as one of the advances, advan advances in the last few years, the idea of um, using a frame to represent the uh, gravitational radiation that is aligned with the instantaneous uh, properties of the radiation so by, you can look at the gravitational waves at each instant in time and define that predominant emission axis. And now you expand your waveforms in spherical harmonics using that axis as the uh, polar axis of the spherical harmonics. And if you play this game, you can take this mass and transform it back down into something fairly simple looking. So what this indicates for the first time, and this has been confirmed since, is that you can, to good approximation, write processing waveforms as non-processing waveforms with the appropriate rotation into the processing frame. <coughs> okay, um, now something completely different. I couldn't resist throwing in two slides that have nothing to do with gravitational waves. Um, there also recent news on, on critical collapse by by a postdoc at, at CETA, Tony Chu. So what he has attempted, uh, continuing the work of Chop, Twig, and Abrams, and Evans in, in the early 90s, is to have an incoming gravitational waves, but this time with angular momentum, and play the same critical phenomena games again. So what's plotted here on the x-axis is the amplitude of the incoming gravitational wave the left is, is slow, is weak, on the right is strong. And on the y-axis is the mass of a black hole if it forms. So for small amplitudes, no black hole forms, so the mass of the black hole is zero. The waves come to the origin, hang around there for a small instant of time, and then disperse out to infinity. And for large amplitudes, we are up here, and a black hole is indeed formed. So the incoming gravitational waves um, propagate into such a small volume with such a high energy density that the horizon forms around them. And what Tony, so it's the same picture we had Choptwick found in 93, nothing for low amplitudes, something interesting for high amplitudes. And Tony right now is, is putting more data points here in the middle to figure out precisely what happens in, in between and what interesting features might, um, might occur. The upper line is the ADM energy of the initial data set. So this is a bound of how much energy is in the initial data, is, is in the space-time. If you have strong gravitational waves, 
the amount of matter in the black hole is almost identical to the ADM energy. That means almost all the energy is, is actually uh, caught by the black hole and only very little propagates away to infinity. Uh, another cool example is uh, news on five-dimensional black strings, a work by Louis Lena and Franz Pretorius. So what these black strings are, they're basically the cross product of a four-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole with a fifth dimension which is compactified. So you have a four-dimensional sphere, and now the black hole is not just a sphere, but it extends as a cylinder along the fifth dimension. As it's compactified, going up there to the top is the same as coming back from the bottom. So you have an infinitely long, it's termed black string. And quite early, uh, 1993, I believe, or thereabouts, uh, it was found that if the compactified dimension is short, the black string will be stable. But if the compactified dimension is long, if a thin, long string, it turns out you can get a lower energy state by taking the string and instead replacing it by a black hole. Just a, a spherical black hole in 5D. And so it was conjectured that there must be some instability that if you start with a long, thin string, it will go unstable, it will deform somehow, and eventually something strange happens, and eventually you should get, at the end of the day, a spherical five-dimensional black hole, which is the lowest energy state. And what precisely happened in this process took about 20 years or so to explore, and to my knowledge, this paper then actually uh, explained it. So up here is the early stage of the black string. Um, this is the compactified dimension. This black line here is the original black string at time equals zero. It goes unstable and develops perturbations that look like these gray lines here, where you actually see first it's a sinusoid, then it gets a higher amplitude sinusoid, and then something, then at some point it needs to change nonlinearly. So what happens is it forms a sphere that is still connected with a, a much thinner black string to the left and right. Now this thinner black string is again unstable to the same instability, so the thinner black string forms a smaller black hole, and then, the small, and then around the smaller black hole you have again uh, yet thinner black strings. These yet thinner black strings again are unstable, and you form more smaller black holes along the way, and you get this, this sequence of large and small black holes still connected by an ever, ever, by a string with ever decreasing diameter. So what is Z here? Z is the a coordinate along the compactified dimension, the one I, I, drew, I, I first indicated up down. I should have moved it to the side, remembering the image, but I didn't. Okay, so this was supposed to give you some flavor of what's going on with, uh, in terms of improvements and recent advances in, in, in black hole simulations. Um, I have half an hour left, 15 uh, minutes? Yes, half an hour. Half an hour, okay. So that means I will need to speed up a little bit. So I will only go extremely briefly over my own code, assuming that Mark and, and Sasha and Dave already covered spectral methods. I, I know you've done uh, finer differences, the, the fundamental difference to spectral methods is that you write your solution as a series in some basis functions. If you were to push this, this uh, expansion up to infinite number of basis functions, you could represent any, fu any function and, you, and your solution would be exact. So the approximation comes in by truncating with a certain n up here. One of the big advantages here is that you can compute many things exactly, for instance, the derivative. The basis functions, say, Chebyshev polynomials, are known analytically. So if you want the derivative, you take the derivative of the Chebyshev polynomial, which you know analytically, and you sum up the series and you're done. So that, that's really nice. And what's not so nice is that 
basis functions are only known for very simple computational domains. Spheres are okay, cubes are okay, cylinders are okay, anything simple. Unfortunately, uh, we want to do black hole excision, so we have two excised spheres here in the middle, and those cannot, and the region outside cannot be easily covered with, with um, a spectral expansion. So we end up doing, uh, doing a domain decomposition, spherical shells around each of the black holes, something more complicated in the media distances. Here, this, this cyan and blue circles are the, the inner parts. And then spherical shells again far, far away. The looks awfully complicated, it is. But one of the really nice things is it allows us to place resolution where we need it. For instance, close to each black hole, the, the space time is approximately spherically symmetric. So spherical harmonics can get away with fairly low L. Far away, the space time again is, is, has very low L angular structure because gravitational waves only have low L content. And so again, far, far away, we can't get away with, with quite few, quite low angular resolution. And that is one of the reasons that makes the, the, uh, the code quite effect, efficient. The basis functions are also different in each domain? Sorry? Your basis functions? The, the basis functions are different because um, the choice of basis functions you must do depends on the topology on the domain. If you have a periodic interval, you use a Fourier series. If you have an open one-dimensional interval, you use Chebyshev. If you have the surface of a sphere, you use spherical harmonics. Um, initial value equations, well, Mark told you about solving one equation when it's simple. We are doing all five of them. The, the big advantage of doing all five of them is that we have more freedom to tailor the initial data to spinning black holes. So one part of the freedom in, in solving the initial data equations is this passkey conformal metric. You can set it to, to be just the Kronecker symbol, the flat metric, then everything becomes so much simpler. Or if you're after highly spinning black holes, you can set it as the sum superposition of two single black hole Kerr metrics. And by, by incorporating the, the Kerr metric right into the free data of the constraint equations, that's the trick that allowed us to go with spins beyond 0.93. So we have initial data with spins all the way up to 0.998 or 0.999 or thereabouts. But evolving it is, is harder than constructing it. Um, no time here. Um, should we Somebody has talked already about channelized harmonics, so I'll, I'll skip this one here as well. There's more technicalities that go on uh, with spectral methods. One of the downside of spectral methods is they are amazingly sensitive to having the entire problem absolutely correct. If there's something in the problem that would be mathematically ill-posed, the spectral method is sure to find it, and it will blow up within one or two time steps. Finite differences are comparatively more forgiving. They will run even if you have a problem somewhere. You might not get the convergence order you expect, but they, they don't blow up as violently as spectral methods. So because of that, we had to do a lot more work on, on deriving good boundary conditions, work that was mostly done by Lee Lindblom and, and, and Mark Scheele. And again, we are using this trick of um, black hole excision and a lot more technical details, which if you like, you can look up in, in the slides afterwards. I've left a lot of detail in the slides um, in the hope that it might be useful for you sometime later as, as a, a reference information. This is one of the first simulations we did, equal mass non-spinning in spiral and merger. Um, the top half shows the trajectories and the apparent horizons. The, bot, the middle half shows the equatorial plane. Height function is the three-dimensional Ricci scalar, color coded by labs with shift errors shown. And at the very bottom is the gravitational waveform that's being emitted. So just one of the, the nice movies you can do once you actually 
have a working code. Okay. Um, with all these technical advances, to give you some context of, of how many simulations are being done and how long they are, here are two of the, the, the more important waveform catalog efforts, the first Ninja project and the second Ninja project, um, which was collecting waveforms community-wide from all numerical relativity groups. The first one ended up with 20 waveforms, typical length about 800 or 1,000 m or so, <coughs> five or six orbits or so. The second one a few years later ended up with twice as many waveforms, all of them much higher accuracy than the first one. And also, if you look carefully, quite a bit longer. So the, the, the blue and the yellow stuff here is numerical relativity. So they're now typically 1,000 to 2,000 m long, so about twice as long as for, for the first Ninja project. So in a few years, twice as many waveforms, twice as much, um, uh, twice as long. Unfortunately, the parameter space is huge and 40 data points aren't that much. And this Ninja 2 project focused on aligned spin simulations where you only have three parameters. The mass ratio, spin one and spin two. So here's a plot, mass ratio, spin one and spin two. And this is where the 40 simulations end up. You have a bunch of simulations at both spins equal zero at different mass ratios. Mm. And you have simulations along this line, which is equal masses and equal spins. So this seems to be something rather typical that happens if, if humans choose numbers. Humans tend to choose special numbers. And that's done for two reasons. The one reason is you need to start simple. And the other reason is, is simple as fallacy that if you're trying to write down numbers that cover parameter space, if you just write down numbers, you will pick special values. So even for this parameter space, there's, there's much to do. And so bigger efforts are underway. And the one I'd, I'd like to, to briefly show you is, is one that we started three years ago and are just finishing up. Um, this point now is 171 simulations. Mass ratio mostly between, between one and two, but a Caesar refraction of threes and five and some up to eight. Length quite a bit longer than anything of this order here. These are something like eight orbits. Uh, we have more like 20 or so on average going up to 33 orbits. So quite a bit more, quite a bit longer waveforms. Uh, this got started three or four years ago. And over those years has consumed about 50 million CPU hours. And what came out of this is this, this waveform catalog, which uh, we have published the first paper. And right now we are cleaning up and, and triple checking all the data to make sure this is actually correct. And which to my knowledge uh, represents the, the, the biggest waveform catalog effort so far. One reason why we could get this going is that we were actually very modest in terms of parameters. Uh, you're already seeing here that most of the black hole mass ratios are between one and two. Also, most of the spins are 0.5 or less because even three, three and four years ago, we were quite confident that we could do spins of 0.5 while still, still working on the higher spins. So in, in that regard, Ninja is actually more extreme because it has a lot of spins of 0.8-ish or so, whereas we have mostly spins of 0.5 and below. Uh, that includes ah okay yes a excellent point one really dirty secret in numerical relativity and i guess in, in any type of numerical work is people always lie about the cost of runs they will always give you the most optimistic number that they somehow can justify so earlier on when showing you this simulation i would have told you it, it is 20000 cpu hours which is really literally just the simulation being plotted here and discounting the 50 trials we had beforehand. So usually uh, any number, any CPU hour estimate you see is a lie. Now back to, to Christian's number. 
the way I came up with this one here is I, I counted up my computing time allocations in the three years, which is something like 65 or 70 million CPU hours. And I took 80% of it because I knew that almost all the time went into this waveform catalog. So this, this number includes all the 50 failed attempts to do the mergers. And it also includes uh, computing time for eccentricity removal and, and anything else along the way. Computing time for the ones where you forget to output the waveforms and all the other strange things that go wrong. Um, two neat examples. Precession cones. Here's, this is the orbital angular momentum happily going around 1.5 cycles, uh, precession cycles in this example. This is a more extreme one where the orbital angular momentum changes by about 100 degrees, orbital trajectories. Um, that's the same waveform I showed very early on to demonstrate how generic waveforms look like, but looking at two different sky orientations yet again, and plotted is H cross and H plus, depending which orientation you have, things can look very, very differently. And of course, like Mark asked you to do, we are also doing convergence tests so here's the phase error in, in these simulations as a function of one, two, three, four, five, five different resolutions. And the big advantage of the spectral methods is that the errors should decay exponentially if you do everything right, not algebraically. And this exponential convergence allows us to get to, to these ridiculously high, low errors. And, event, and that's basically the high accuracy was the reason why we chose to do spectral methods to begin with. Um, George Attack always also had a similarly large study of processing binaries, 191 waveforms, but shorter than, than the, the spec waveforms. And they were able to draw quite a set of interesting conclusions from their waveforms. Um, again, they confirmed that a processing waveform to very good approximation is a non-processing waveform times a rotation. Um, they checked how well the current waveform models fit their waveform catalog, and they fit quite well, better than 95%, usually quite a bit better. They also went into beginning to work out what you can actually measure when you observe gravitational waves. And they confirmed what you would expect, that at low masses, where the in-spiral is in the frequency band of LIGO, you measure data corresponding to the in-spiral compact object binary, like mass ratio or, or total mass. But at high masses, where only the merchant ring down is in, is in the LIGO frequency band, you're more sensitive to numbers. You can better determine numbers of the final black hole, like the final mass and the final spin. So all of that looks quite cons consistent and, and promising. What's now next to do is to actually expand parameter space um, here's how perimeter space looks like for, for our 170 simulations. Mass ratio here, pretty much everything is mass ratio, mass ratio 2 and below. And spin here, where pretty much most is a spins less than 0.5. And so there's this huge, vast, empty space here for the black hole A spin and here for the black hole B spin that, that needs to be filled in. I, I never can resist showing movies. So this is a movie of a, a processing spinning simulation. The black hole is color coded by the spin. So the dark regions are the, the polar regions. <coughs> and this, this violet plane is the instantaneous orbital plane. And so you already see how the orbital plane changes quite dramatically. And for Mark and Sasha, this is one of the Samurai 2 runs uh, we've been doing last year. Mass ratio 3, big black hole spin 0.75, little black hole spin 0. So I've managed to do movies, but I've not yet managed to actually do the science project we set out to do. It's, it's a little bit sad that, that the undergrad who's, who's doing the movies was actually quicker than, than the professor doing the science. How do you define this already um, R cross R dot. You take the separation vector between the black holes, compute its time derivative, and, and the inner product. OK. Um, 
So the, the big picture of, of binary black holes, those simulations are quite mature. There's a lot of parameter space that, uh, that, that needs to exploring. And the boundaries of the parameter space are which what causes the problems. Spins close to maximal mass ratios beyond, say, 10 or so. The present goal for, for black hole, binary black hole simulations is to, and I might be a little bit ambitious here, but it's always good to be ambitious, is to remove waveform modeling as a source of error for LIGO. Being able to know with the simulations the waveforms so well that LIGO can simply take them as being the truth, the exact waveforms. And so that requires exploring all parameters with enough accuracy in the simulations. Check where you can do post-Newtonian runs, how far you can trust post-Newtonian, constructing waveform models, and perform injection studies to actually see how big or how small errors in the waveforms can LIGO still, uh, is LIGO still susceptible to. Okay, so there's more details about this right here, which I unfortunately have to jump over. This is a, a little black hole post-Newtonian numerical relativity comparison we did in 2007. Um, the bottom line is post-Newtonian ap appears to be worse than we had all had anticipated. And the post-Newtonian error just before the start of numerical relativity seems to be one of the leading sources of error in waveform modeling. Um, a short reminder of how you actually go off to construct waveform models um, with the Phenom models pioneered by Achieve and the EOB models. Unfortunately, I, I need to go over. And I guess my last 15 minutes or so, I, I'd like to briefly present a short survey of results for non vacuum simulations. Starting with black holes with some stuff around, which were done by uh, the Illinois group around Stu Shapiro. They also have a newer paper on this. And they were done by the Georgia Tech group. So the idea here is you, you, you try to get a handle on what happens if you have a black hole merger while you have gas present, for instance, at the center of galaxies. And what uh, the Shapiro group found is that as long as the black holes are widely separated, each black hole essentially acts like a individual black hole just accreting gas. No surprise there. Later, after the, the black hole has merged, the same is true. You have one bigger black hole just accreting gas. And in between, just before merger, you have some interesting intermediate phase where you get a fairly large enhancement in luminosity from the accreting matter. So this might be one of the electromagnetic signatures to look for. Also, this is a very, very simple and first step analysis. Georgia Tech takes something similar. Um, you can also look at a certain approximation of electrodynamics, which is thought to be applicable close to black holes, called force-free uh, electrodynamics and work out what type of electromagnetic jets you would expect around black holes when they are spinning and when they are merging. And you get interesting features, but my understanding is that those purely vacuum electromagnetic features will not be visible to a large enough distance to actually be of relevance for uh, electromagnetic counterparts. So to really see electromagnetic counterparts, um, you need to look at mixed binaries or binary neutron stars. And the first and most important message here is that matter is much harder than black holes, than vacuum. And therefore, the goals are much more modest for these matter simulations. For binary black holes, we aim to solve the, the modeling problem completely, period. For, black, for mixed binaries and binary neutron stars, the question is rather right now to explore all the different things that can happen to get the qualitative features correct and not the complete quantitative details. So um, goals for these mixed simulations, obviously black hole, uh, the gravitational waves, um, to test which one of these two sources, 
perhaps one, perhaps the other, perhaps both, perhaps none, could be the progenitors of, of gamma ray bursts, short gamma ray bursts. To get a gamma ray burst, we think we need a massive disk and a funnel region where the gamma rays and the material can uh, escape. And a third important goal is to figure out how much unbound ejector are being emitted in such a merger. Most of the material will go into the remnant, but some can be emitted out to infinity on unbound trajectories. That material is, is very, very important because it essentially behaves like a mini supernova and gives rise to a lot of different electromagnetic features that you can then go off and look for afterwards. In particular, features that decay on longer timescales than the seconds or so of gamma ray bursts. So these ejectors might actually lead to signatures that last weeks or perhaps even months. Okay, so what can happen if you have a, one of these compact object binary mergers? So let's start with the binary neutron stars. They merge, and now three things can happen. You either have low enough, low enough mass that you just find a bigger remnant neutron star. You can also have high enough mass to immediately collapse to a black hole. Or you can form a hypermassive remnant that somehow supports itself for a little bit of time against gravitational collapse, for instance, by temperature or by uh, differential rotation. But once it cools down or the differential rotation subsides, it will collapse to a black hole. So you either form a, a, a big neutron star or a black hole with a larger or smaller disk of some size. For mixed binaries, um, you can either disrupt the neutron star before it is being eaten by the black hole, then you get a black hole in the disk, or the, black, the neutron star can get eaten entirely as one big thing, then you just get a bigger black hole. And precisely where the, the mixed binary is disrupt versus direct plunge depends on the spin of the black hole and the mass ratio. <coughs> Essentially, mass, large black holes have small tidal fields. Therefore, for large black holes, it's less likely to get tightly disrupted. So large black holes is down here, small mass ratios. So at small mass ratios, you will not have a tidal disruption of the neutron star. Unless you crank up the spin a lot, because with increasing spin, uh, the innermost stable circular orbit moves in, and you can have, you get the, the neutron star into a, a deeper into the gravitational field where the tidal forces are stronger. So the, the general rule of thumb is to get tidal disruption, you either need Smallish, ma smallish mass ratios, or you need large spins on the black hole. Um, short list of, of current black hole neuron star activity and, and more recent activities. Here's a, a movie of a black hole neutron star binary where with, where the, which actually has precession built in. This simulation gives you a tidal tail, which you see quite nicely. And because of the precession, the tidal tail actually then turns into a volume filling uh, structure. Here's a newer simulation, also from, from Francois Foucault, investigating the effect of black hole spin on the uh, tail. On the left hand side, so both these are mass ratio 7, which is quite large mass ratio which we actually expect astrophysically. Here the black hole spin is 0.5, and it's hard to see, but virtually all mass of the neutron star is in this blob here, which shortly after this, this frame will fall into the black hole, and you have virtually no disk and virtually no ejector. On the other hand, with spins of 0.9, we get much more tidal disruption. You get this long tail of material a disk of about 20% of a solar mass and it checked off about 5% of a solar mass. So changing the spin from 0.5 to 0.9 changes dramatically the outcome of this particular simulation. And also the expectation for waveforms and electromagnetic counterparts. 
Let's skip over this. There's also simulations of magnetic black hole neutron star binaries, uh, Chavlala et al. Um, Franz Pretorius, with, with, with his group, looked into hyperboloidal and eccentric black hole neutron star binaries. <coughs> so if you shoot the neutron star and the black hole essentially on, right at each other, the neutron star gets eaten. If you have a somewhat larger um, impact parameter, you get really large tidal tail, and yet larger impact parameter, you get a, a periodic mass transfer. So again, quite a lot of activity. Um, Japan group, uh, AI group, West Biotti. Japan, Japan as well, uh, AI group, Japan, Japan. There's also papers now by, uh, by Jena and, and Cornell Caltech has one in, in um, preparation. These simulations begin to explore various physics effects. For instance, here is uh, an exploration of different equations of state. We don't know the equation of state of nuclear matter above nuclear densities, but that's relevant for neutron stars. And so depending on what type of nuclear equation of state there might be, you see that different things happen to your um, uh, black binary neutron star system. For very low high masses, you always get prompt collapse to a black hole. For very low masses, you always get a, a, a hypermassive neutron star. But precisely where the boundaries are, at which total mass you get one versus the other, depends on the details of the equation of state. Um, the simulations begin to incorporate more and more microphysics. The neutrinos are important because they are the dominant mechanism to cool the neutron star, neutron star matter. So depending how much cooling you have, a hypermassive neutron star remnant might survive for longer or not so long. And this again will depend on the temperature, the equation of state, and various other properties. So the, the duration to, for which a neutron star, hypermassive neutron star actually lives will be one of the, the key signatures to figuring out uh, information about the, the, the system. And also, of course, um, there's the hope that we can actually measure the, ex the emitted neutrinos. Here's the neutrino flux for three different models uh, that were investigated by Sekiguchi et al. Um, more movies I don't really have time to, I'm, I'm afraid. But what this simulation showed, it, it showed for the first time a very clear signature of something like a jet forming. Um, unfortunately, making claims about gamma ray bursts and jets are very big claims. And so these type of simulations still await confirmation, independent confirmations by other groups. <clears throat> simulations also have gone beyond a simple GR plus matter. For instance, uh, here's a recent uh, images from a study of binary neutron stars in scalar tensor theory. And depending on how important the, the scalar field actually is in this modified theory of gravity, you can find um, merger quite late as usual for, for just GR, or with increasing strength of the scalar field component, uh, the system merges more and more rapidly. So again, this, the, the time to merger might be some way to disentangle with, uh, uh, and, and learn about alternative theories of gravity. Um, are you knowing what way these parameters are pushing the boundaries of what has been already constrained from the local constraints and uh, for this particular simulation, I don't know. But there are regions of perimeter space which are not constrained, where you can get an effect called spontaneous scalarization, where you first have neutron stars that are basically behaving as neutron stars, 
But as they spiral in, they cross a magic threshold and very quickly a lot of scalar field accumulates on the neutron stars, quite dramatically uh, changing the, the final in spiral. And there's definitely certain regions of parameter space that aren't excluded for this uh, spontaneous scalarization. Uh, Okay, so, so my knowledge here comes from a talks at the APS and meeting in April. Um, perhaps I've misunderstood something, perhaps there's something new coming out since then. And here's my totally one slide on neutron stars. If you want to know more about neutron stars, Christian Ott is the, the person to talk to. This is the, the placeholder slide to remind you that compact object binaries are by far not everything that's out there that is of relevance for, for numerical relativity. Um, one other prime example are precisely the co supernova simulations, which unfortunately are yet more difficult than, than compact object binaries because it turns out a much larger range of microphysics is of very high importance for getting the supernovas to explode or not. You absolutely need to get neutrinos right you need to, to think very carefully about chemical composition and magnetic fields will likely also play a role. So these are, are yet harder than, than compact object binaries. Okay, um, one more slide on mixed binaries and then one slide about the f future. So the, the more on the technical side of challenges for these mixed binary simulations are to get increase the accuracy of the simulations. It turns out that hydrodynamics converges to, to lower order than the vacuum simulations, so you need more grid points, more work to get a certain accuracy. Especially if you have shocks which are really, really hard to get right and, and get accurate. But also realistic equation of state have discontinuities at phase transitions of the matter. And they are also very hard to model numerically. Um, a lot of work right now is going, is going into neutrino transport, making neutrino emission more realistic so we can determine what uh, neutrino signal to expect, and also um, making the temperature evolution of the neutron stars more realistic because neutrinos are the leading uh, cooling mechanism. Magnetic fields are very, very important. We know they get excited in in accretion disks by an, by an uh, instability called the magnetorotational instability. Unfortunately, that instability is happening on such small scales that the current evolutions aren't accurate enough to see it. And so we know that as far as magnetic fields go, uh, the current simulations almost certainly are very, very wrong because the excitation via the MRI simply isn't captured yet. The Illinois group has made quite uh, promising pro progress recently. And finally, um, the, the parameter space needs to be explored, both for black hole neutron stars and for binary neutron stars. Different mass ratios, um, different equation of state, different spin of the black holes. And so there's a lot of simulations that need to be run to, to just determine which systems form disks, how big the disks are, and even more simulations then later on have to be run to, f to compute the waveforms accurately and to find out which features, if any, could be measured with gravitational waves. Okay, um, one slide conjecture of what might become important in the, the coming years. And again, I'm, I'm very open to um, comments and discussion with the audience. We have quite a few experts here in the room. <coughs> Um, so for binary black holes, for the vacuum system, um, a lot of attention will continue to go to processing waveform models. We simply want to compute them and, and want to compute them accurately everywhere in par parameter space. There will also be effort going into targeted simulation in response to detections. 
Right now, we run simulations in preparation for detections. We, we try to cover all the parameter space reasonably well. But once LICO has seen a certain event at certain parameters, it's, uh, numerical relativity could go in and actually simulate right there with higher accuracy and higher precision. And how to do this in an effective way and, and then use these results to fold back into LIGO to improve uh, statements that LIGO is making. Eccentric systems so far have been largely ignored because the general law is that eccentricity is being radiated away and so we have finite resources and so let's do the simple thing, that's the most important thing first, the, the non-eccentric binaries. But there is a steady stream of proposals how you can generate eccentric binary black holes and that the, suggesting that they might be relevant for LIGO. Plus, even if you don't believe in eccentric binary black holes, you need to have eccentric binary black hole waveforms in order to make statements how sensitive LIGO is to eccentric binary black holes. If LIGO doesn't see them, it simply is simply because LIGO search pipelines are not sensitive to them. We will see an increasing amount of work going into alternative gravity, scalar tensor gravities and beyond. And also higher dimensional gravity plays more and more a role. Not necessarily for gravitational wave detections, but for more theory, for other applications of GR. And so one of the questions that comes up with these alternative gravities is, can gravitational wave observations actually distinguish between gravitation between general relativity and alternative theories. How well can we test GR with gravitational waves? Uh, matter simulations will continue to put a lot of effort into microphysics, neutrinos, magnetic fields, equation of states, chemical composition, there's a vast number of things, and will perform larger and larger parameter studies with increasing amount of microphysics to firm up certain key scenarios that have been done before and also covering more of parameter space. A lot of effort will go into understanding uh, jets forming from an accretion disk uh, to explain possibly gamma ray bursts and also uh, the electromagnetic and neutrino signatures and the same is true for ejector, unbound material which will behave very differently, decay on, on, on months time scales with very different electromagnetic signatures. And again, what, what's needed here actually for both of these points is in some sense hardcore numerical relativity simulations to get the in spiral merchant of the compact object right. And then you need to switch to different techniques to simulate the very vastly different time scales of the jet formation and of the ejector um, evolution. So the, those will likely be done with the hybrid codes when relativity comes in first and then you switch to something more adaptive, adapted later on. And one of the key questions in the whole business here is what neutron star properties can we measure based on gravitational waves? And Right now, it, I guess the answer to that question, again, isn't really known. Um, we have some studies that, that say we can measure the compactness of the star reasonably well, the ratio of uh, mass to radius. But this also will be a very steep function of black hole spin and black hole mass. So again, this isn't really explored in any uh, sufficient and comprehensive detail at all. And that's where I stop. Thank you. So, thanks, Cheryl, for this excellent uh, review of the current discussion. We have time for a few more questions. If there are any more questions. Or is it just simulation for. Accent here? Yeah, why do we say that like more? Is that something not plausible? Okay, so the, the, the fundamental reason is that if you look at lowest order post-Newtonian theory in the low eccentricity regime, you find that the eccentricity during an in-spiral goes like the semi-major axis of the binary 
to the power to a power of something like approximately 1.5. 1912s, I believe it is. So eccentricity decays like distance separation to the minus 1.5. If you form your binary black hole from stars, the stars are at least a million kilometers quick. Otherwise, they would have merged already. And so you would expect the binary black hole to have an initial distance of at least a million kilometers. Give or take a factor of 10, I don't really care. A million kilometers is 10 to the 5 Schwarzschild radii. So you pick up a factor of 10 to the 5 to the 1.5. Your eccentricity goes down by 10 million. That, that's the, the basic argument why we don't really believe in eccentric binaries. And then the, the, stu the, the theoretical studies that come up with eccentric binaries look at alternative formation channels. That you look at globular clusters where you have a lot of black holes in the middle and you have free body interactions that might result in eccentric binaries. That you look at the vicinity of the supermassive black hole in the center of galaxies, you consider a black hole binary close to the supermassive black hole, and it turns out you can treat the supermassive black hole as a perturber of the binary, and via a mechanism called the cosi resonance, you can excite very high eccentricity of the, of the binary black hole. And so it is known that all these effects can happen, and it is known, it is demonstrated that you can get eccentricities of 0.9 or, or thereabouts. The very big uncertainty is how often they will happen. Whether LIGO will see, whether 20%, the, there were suggestions that 50% of LIGO sources would be eccentric, but there's also arguments and, and, and people arguing that LIGO will see one eccentric binary in, in, in per thousand years. And so precisely where we are in there is where the, the argument goes on. How, how, how likely these eccentric sources actually are in, in, in our universe. Wow. Thank you. That's bad. And we will have a group follow after